Hey, good deal. So, uh, so I wanted to thank you all for letting me be here today. I am one of several uh, extension specialists within um, at Mississippi State, and uh, my background is wildlife. Um, it's a topic that I enjoy talking about and sharing with people. And uh, as Christian asked me to talk about bats and the home landscape, so that's what I'm going to take this time, uh, next 30 or 40 minutes or so, to do that. And then certainly if uh, there are questions afterwards, I'd be happy to answer them. I'm not gonna be able to see the chat uh, on my share screen, so uh, we'll have to remember to get back to that when we get to the end. So one of the things that many people don't recognize is that bats uh, are the second most common group of mammals in the world. So mammals is a class of organism, organisms, other classes include birds and a class of reptiles and a class of amphibians, class of fish. But within the class of mammals, there are a number of different orders. Uh, rodents is the biggest group, all the mice and rats and squirrels, but bats is the second most common group, uh, most commonly uh, available animals that are out there. There are 14, more than 1400 bat species in the entire world. So a lot of diversity that's out there. And uh, it's just, they're just fascinating organisms. There's uh, different sizes and different shapes, different colors. They, they all have different adaptations depending on where they live and what they feed on. And you can see in this slide, just some of the funny faces that, that are out there on these little creatures. Uh, but many people have this view of bats as being something evil. And uh, that probably has come from images such as these fruit bats, a uh, picture that was taken in a captive situation. You can see that they are hanging upside down from a cage roof and not from a tree as they would have been in the wild. But these fruit bats are large. And you can see where the, the, their wings folded around them makes them look a little bit like a coat, a cloak, and uh, somewhat, uh, I don't know, somewhat sinister looking but in reality, they're just large mammals that like to eat fruits. But it's probably contributed to some of the myths that are out there surrounding bats. But the ones we have here in the US are not so intimidating. They're all uh, very small. Uh, and I have done programs before when I've asked people to, to show me just how big they think a bat is, to hold their hands up and show me with their hands the wingspan of a bat. And uh, I'm amazed by how large people think that they really are. And then when I show them a specimen of a bat and they see how small they really are, they, they're, um, they're just surprised. It's just not the image they had in their head of what these animals really look like. And so bats, bats get kind of a bad rap. Um, they get blamed for things like flying into people's hair, like in the Gary Larson cartoon that's there on the right. Um, people think that they drink blood which some of them do, uh, really only three species out of about the 1400 that we were talking about earlier, do consume blood as, as part of their diet. And, um, and they, do, uh, they do carry rabies, but only about uh, less than one half of 1% will go on to become rabid. And so um, it's not a major concern. It's something to be respectful of and, and to be cautious of if you were to see a bat, for example, on the ground, um, but it's, it's not the only species, or they aren't the only species that carry rabies, and uh, and it's really not something that they're you have to worry about them attacking you because they have rabies. So really, these are not evil animals. Uh, they're just a different kind of animal that has a role in the environment. And so what I want to be able to do is to share a little bit some of the cool things that they that they do. Um, bats are uh, the only flying mammal that exists on the planet. There are some others that soar, like flying squirrels, but, and some of the primates will actually launch in, in somewhat of a, of a gliding fashion, but bats legitimately fly using these modified wings that you can see, or modified hands rather, that you can see in their wings. It shows up so well in this, in this picture. Um, just like you, they have shoulders and an elbow but the distance between their elbow to their wrist is a little bit elongated. And then their hands that you can see out there at the van have very, very long fingers. Um, and they have even what looks like a thumb there that they could use to grip so that's there on the top part of their wing. 
So just a really interesting organism. Bats are a long lived species. Most things that are small don't live very long. So you think about something like a mouse, which only lives about a year or so, uh, versus something like an elephant, which can live decades. But bats, despite their size, are really long lived organisms. And so the average lifespan for a Townsend big eared bat that you see pictured here is 16 years. Um, some band recovery work has shown that bats can live up to 40 years. Uh, so you kind of have to respect an organism that can live that long and, uh, and just not treat them as being an enemy, I guess. Uh, one of the rumors or the myths about bats is that they are blind. So you hear the expression blind is a bat and that's just not true. They, they aren't blind, they can see just fine. But they, because I think they fly at night, people just assume that they can't see. They use echolocation uh, or sonar type uh, system where they make clicks and small sounds and they are able to uh, process the bounce uh, off of items to be able to assess where they are just much like a submarine does. Uh, in the spy movies, when one submarine is, is pinging the other, uh, bats have been doing it longer than people and submarines have been doing that. So just a really novel way of negotiating, but they can see just fine. Bats uh, eat thousands of flying insects each night. And so not, uh, these are not troublesome organisms. These are actually very beneficial organisms. Uh, if you think about sitting out at night on your porch, for example, and about the flying insects that kind of find you, when you're sitting there trying to enjoy the evening, uh, things like mosquitoes and beetles and moths and other kind of pest insects, these are the prey base for bats. And so they play a really important role in controlling insects that are capable of passing on disease to us, like Zika virus that people were concerned about a couple years ago that is transmitted by mosquitoes. And there are many, many more uh, mosquito-borne diseases like malaria and uh, chicken lunga virus, these are out there in the landscape. And so bats are just natural pest control and natural disease control. They're beneficial because they not only provide this insect control, but they also help uh, pollinate fruits, plants like the, uh, avocados and bananas and the uh, saguaro and agave. Uh, plants and those are important food crops for us as people, but they also in many parts of the world are responsible for for starting new forests because they consume the fruit and the seeds and when the seeds pass through the animal's body as it's flying around and moving from place to place, it disperses the seeds around and so new forests are generated through the actions of these bats and uh, as someone who truly appreciates good chocolate. Um, Cocoa is one of those plants. It's shown here in the middle uh, with those small seeds that are, that are bat dispersed. Um, so that helps keep the cocoa plants growing, which I am grateful for. They are also beneficial in addition to the insect control and the seed dispersal and pollination services. They also are important for providing uh, nutrient cycling. The bat guano or their droppings that collects uh, has been for a long time a source of fertilizer for people. So it can be collected and, and reprocessed to be fertilizer. It used to be used in gunpowder and other explosive devices. And it's important also in, uh, in just cycling nutrients through forests. It provides there's some really cool research that shows that bat guano is important to tropical rainforests to maintain uh, the growth of that forest. Tropical rainforest soils are generally fairly poor and very thin which is one of the problems that happens when, uh, or becomes evident whenever forests are cut down in the tropics to make room for agriculture. That soil doesn't stay, uh, doesn't stay in place very well if it, there's a lot of topography and it doesn't last very long um, because it's just not uh, very rich and it's not very deep and it just wears out fast. So having bats in the landscape provides a, a source of nutrients to those trees that are in that tropical rainforest system and it helps uh, helps maintain that rain source, rainforest. So in the absence of bats, it's a, they, not only the forests are in trouble because the seeds aren't being dispersed, 
but they're losing some of the fertilizers that they would have naturally coming into that system. So just to uh, maybe give you a little bit about bi biology, in addition to the fact that they are flying mammals, uh, they, there are many different systems. So some are fruit eaters, some are insect eaters. Some live in large groups like this Mexican free-tailed bat picture that you see on the left here, um, can live in groups of thousands upon thousands. Uh, free-tailed bats are also ones that show up a lot of times in people's homes, in attics. Uh, we, um, we have them here on campus in some buildings periodically, which causes a great deal of excitement. Um, but then there are other bat species like the Indiana bat or the tricolored bat that, um, that are either solitary or only come together in small groups for some times of the year. Like oh, in the winter time, they will might uh, get into small groups to hibernate because the, the beneficial uh, benefits to be gained by hi uh, hibernating together, they can keep each other warm. But they may spend the rest of their time alone or in groups of, uh, in family groups. So these are mammals. They, uh, they breed and they produce uh, a single pup every year. That's what a baby bat is called, is a pup. Um, the mother feeds that uh, baby milk uh, that she produces in her body. She doesn't feed him insects or anything, but she's a mammal. So she's producing milk in her body and that's what her baby feeds on. So the mother will go out at night and forage for insects at night, leave the baby behind, uh, either in a cave, if they're a cave dwelling species or in a tree, if that's the, their home and then she comes back at night and feeds it and checks on it and then spends the, the day sleeping. They are nocturnal animals. So as I mentioned before, some of these, uh, some of these bats are forest dwellers. Many, many are actually. Um, people tend to think that bats live in caves uh, and some do, but a good number of them are forest dwellers. Um, they like to live around uh, what we call a riparian zone. So it's a, around a stream or a creek and they'll fly up and down the, the creeks and forage on insects at night and then go back into hollow trees, tree cavities, spaces up underneath loose bark and they'll spend the day in that shelter. But other bats do like the, the, uh, the rumor or people's perception is they do live in caves um, and there are a number of bats that are cave dependent and so the picture in the middle with the saguaro, I mean, with the prickly pear in the front is, uh, is Carlsbad Caverns out in New Mexico. And then the other picture with all the bats in front of it is the world's largest population of bats. Uh, it's a place called Bracken Cave in Texas. And both Bracken Cave and Carlsbad Cavern actually have a setup near the entrance to the caves where people can come at night and watch these thousands and thousands of bats come out at night. Uh, and of course, the Park Service wouldn't do that if it was hazardous to people to do that. So um, kind of reiterates that idea that these are not dangerous species. So, so I had this little <laughs> this picture here I found, bats need friends too. Uh, and you can see it's from Carlsbad National uh, Park. Um, bats are in trouble uh, as a group. And um, you all are part of a, of a nature oriented group and that's why you're participating in this call because this is something that interests you and um, many people might recognize other animals that are in decline like bird species we have some bird species or tropical rainforest species are in trouble or polar bears are in trouble uh, because of changing uh, climates and environments in which the polar bears live but many people don't recognize that uh, the bats are in trouble uh, and they need friends too uh, one of the reasons they're in trouble is something that's called white nose syndrome. Uh, white nose syndrome is killing bats and more than uh, six and a half million bats have been documented as, as dying from this disease. Um, it's, it's a fungus that grows on the bat's face around their nose. So you can see in this picture, uh, at first glance, it's kind of cute because it's got this little white circle around its nose, but that's really actually a fungus that's growing on their face. And you can see in the picture, on the, on the left that it's not just growing on their face, but also growing on their wing membranes. Um, the, the fungus is evidently uh, irritating to the bats and it causes them to, to wake up while they're in hibernation. And um, hibernation is a very uh, critical time because the animals aren't feeding during that time, they're hibernating. 
and uh, they're living uh, on just the stores of fat that they've been able to put into their bodies. Well, when they're caused, when they're waken, woken up by this disease, or if they're woken up by people coming into their caves, for example, that causes their metabolism to rise, their heart rate rises, and it causes them to burn more calories. And what ends up killing the bats is not uh, the fungus itself, it's not toxic to them, but the bats will die of starvation because they will be woken up so many times that the, their fat stores are depleted and they, um, they'll die of starvation before the winter is over. And they'll die by the hundreds um, within a cave. So uh, it's a really serious uh, situation and it's been a real challenge for biologists to try to deal with something that it's difficult to fight. Uh, wind turbines uh, are killing bats and um, you know as ecologists, as conservationists, the idea of wind energy is, is appealing but there are some downsides to it and uh, one of the big downsides to it is these are uh, these are very large uh, wind turbines. They're not just small little picturesque windmills like you see in the old timey farms. And the, they generate a lot of wind pressure and changes in air pressure. And the bats uh, are strangely uh, attracted to the wind turbines. And no one really understands why that's happened. Um, but they, the bats are going into those areas where the turbines are. Uh, maybe because the turbines are in places where the bats fly anyway, which is probably also true, but there's some thoughts that the sound they might be making or the vibration that the turbines are making might be drawing the, bat, the bats in. No one really knows. Lots of hypotheses, no answers. Um, but what they do know is that uh, 200,000 bats are dying annually um, because of wind turbines, um, either direct collisions or, um, or related causes. So air pressure changes that causes their lungs to, uh, to fail or being slammed to the ground because of the wind, uh, not so much striking the blades of the turbine. Um, and we see this on the bird side too. Uh, they, they can be disruptive to birds in many places because they're sighted where there's a lot of wind and those same places where there's a lot of wind for birds, to, I mean, for the turbines is also the places where birds are traveling along migration routes and so they encounter these turbines and uh, either striking on the turbine blades or the, the changes in the wind and air pressures associated with them causes the birds to be killed as well. So uh, mixed blessing on the wind turbines. Uh, a big reason for bats uh, being in decline is habitat loss. This is really the driver for most endangered species. It just looks different depending on what kind of, what species or group we're talking about. But a lot of our riparian corridors, those forested uh, waterways um, are cleared to make room for pasture like you see in this photo here or agri other agricultural practices. And that doesn't leave a place for insects that draw on the bats and it doesn't leave a place for the bats themselves to live in. And so uh, the bat habitat is being lost. Same thing on a larger scale, of course, for the tropical rainforest bats. Um, if you lose the entire forest that they live in, then obviously you're going to lose the bats as well. For the bats that live in caves, um, obviously you're not going to lose the habitat of the cave because something's happened to the cave. But people use caves and um, they can be very disruptive to bats that are using the caves either as maternity colonies, so they're in there with the babies and the, and the mothers get disoriented when people come in there and the babies fall and are killed. Um, or uh, people come in there in, in the wintertime, as I mentioned before, it causes the bats to arouse out of hibernation and they die from starvation. So uh, communicating to people the, the value of staying out of those caves um, sometimes works and other times they have to gate them. And so what you see on the right hand side in this picture here is uh, a specially designed bat cave, uh, bat gate rather, that uh, bats will fly through through that space uh, and be able to go in and out, but it, people cannot get in there. So it's they're they're employed in places where um, there is no other option for protecting the bats. Uh, we talked about habitat loss and habitat uh, destruction, but um, the prey base for many bat species is being destroyed. 
when we use insecticides in the environment, especially on a large scale like you see here in this photo, uh, then you're destroying the prey base that the bats uh, depend upon and so they don't have anything to eat and so therefore they do not survive. Um, so what we have now in the U.S. is eight uh, bats on the federal endangered species list. Um, some of those are cave dwelling bats, some of those are forest dwelling bats. Um, there are others that are being considered for listing by the federal government, um, but they, they are in trouble, which is supports where I was, my premise, they need some friends. So you're, let's say you're a homeowner and you want to do what you can to kind of promote bats in your area. And one way to do that is where it's not a safety hat, a safety hazard, excuse me, is go ahead and leave those, those trees that have cavities in them, uh, or maybe they have a dead branch or two and the branch isn't in any danger of falling on your roof because that dead branch uh, may have sloughed off bark, the bats can crawl up inside. Um, things like this screech owl that you see in this picture will also use cavities. So it's not just the bats that we use them, but other, other wildlife will use these kind of spaces. So um, to leave dead timber uh, is not a bad thing um, unless it's a safety hazard. And then of course you've got to, got to remove that. Uh, bat houses have become very popular in some parts of the country. Um, this is a smaller bat house in this pictures, um, the kind that you would put out uh, perhaps in your, in your yard, um, but they can be very elaborate structures uh, and, and can hold thousands and thousands of bats, depending on um, where they're located and what species are in the area. Um, but these are um, special, they have a special uh, design and you can find plans for bat houses on there. Um, but bat houses need to be kind of placed out in open spaces where they get about seven hours of daylight uh, at a time. So this one that's in the shaded spot in the picture is not a good place for it. Um, other places that need to be stay away from is um, like things like burn barrel barrels or places where people get in there and and shake them or throw things at them or spray them with water or whatever like that that they because uh, they're vulnerable in these locations. But it, the bats can fly up inside the bottom of it and hang out in there during the daytime and come back out during the night and it provides the same kind of structure as as um, what we found in a tree. So it replaces what might be missing in the landscape. Another practice is just to avoid the insecticides that might be uh, removing the prey base for those bats. Um, there's a place for insecticide that I heard uh, Christian chatting with someone about a, a late swing problem. Uh, so there is a place, but sometimes people just get a little overzealous in their application. And uh, there's, there's some consequences. And I guess just the, to be wise in your use and recognize that you, there are other consequences besides uh, removing the insects. Uh, you might be removing some of the prey base for other animals like birds and bats that might need some of that food that you have on your property. Um, another way to help protect bats and other wildlife is to keep cats indoors. Um, I, I like cats. I, I have actually four in my house right now. Um, and it, when I was a kid growing up, we had an outdoor or cat, indoor outdoor cat. That cat was always bringing home um, birds and shrews and mice and other assorted things, but they will also um, bring home bats, like you can see here in this picture. And a couple years ago, uh, here in Starkville, there was a, a case of rabies um, in a cat that they traced back to a rat, and it caused a little bit of a stir because someone had tried to pick up this cat and they got scratched and bit by uh, a feral cat that turned out had been uh, exposed to rabies. So uh, you don't want to have that your cat destroying wildlife and you don't want to have your cat outdoor eating wildlife that could then bring back problems to you, like not just rabies, but um, many animals like rabbits have worms in them. And so um, I don't know about you, but I don't want my cat sitting on me if it's got a wormy backside. So it's just better to keep them indoors and, uh, and then they'll be safer and healthier and the wildlife will be happier. So another common problem is that bats get into houses. And one of the reasons they do this is because habitat's limiting for them. 
uh, in a natural environment and a house makes a good substitute. You got things like chimneys that look a whole lot like a hollow tree, little gaps under siding and under porches, uh, and then vents that look a whole lot like rough bark. And uh, so these tiny little animals can get in tiny little holes and they will. Um, so the, excuse me, the best way to, um, to deal with that is, if at all possible, is to make sure you don't provide that habitat in the first place. So inspect uh, those loose places on your house, make sure they're closed up using some kind of a ceiling foam or screening or put a cap on your chimney that'll keep not only bats out, but also birds. And so do your best to try to exclude bats from getting in there in the first place. But it can be challenging. They're small creatures and they can get into small spaces. Um, if bats do end up in your house, uh, what, the, what the scientists recommend is you use some kind of screen like you see here in the lower left, uh, lower right hand corner where uh, the screen is tacked across the top of the gap that the bats are coming in and out of. And you, if you tack the screen just across the top, but you leave the bottom loose, the bats will come out, they'll drop out the bottom of that screen. But when they come back in, they're not gonna, they don't think uh, to go back under that screen. They, you know, the screen will be hanging down and they're just not gonna push through and up and go back in the way they came. So they won't be able to get back in. So they'll be trapped on the outside. The advantage of having that set up uh, rather than to put the screen over there fully is if you trap the bats inside, they can't get out to feed, they're going to die in your house. Um, and then that creates an odor problem until they're done decomposing. And especially if you have a lot of bats in there, um, that's just probably not something you want to do. So this is just a, a suggested way of, of allowing the bats to escape out and go do their bat thing and uh, not die in your house. So just to kind of wrap it all up, um, this is a picture uh, with my Bats Need Friends sign of Carlsbad. And you see all these folks just sitting around uh, watching the bats in the air. Um, they don't have to be fearful um, that the bats are going to come down and get in their hair uh, or attack them or carry off their children or whatever the uh, fears may be. They're just really enjoying the spectacle of seeing thousands and thousands of animals free and in the wild. Um, I will say in all cases with wildlife, it's important to remember that these animals, um, although I, you know, the joke is bats need friends, they really aren't your friend in the sense that they want to hang out with you like, uh, like your dog or your cat does. And um, every year out west, there are people that get injured by wildlife uh, because they get too close. They don't, they don't respect the wildlife. They don't give it its space. And the same thing goes with bats. Um, the bats aren't going to seek you out to harm you, but they also aren't going to want to hang out on your shoulder and be your friend. And so um, wise um, gaps between people and animals is always, uh, is always a good plan. Um, but uh, that is all I have. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I click the right button. There we go. And um, I see that there's been some posts here. So if it's all right with you, Christian, I'll just maybe read through some of these and answer. Is that all right? Absolutely. Okay. Um, so let me get me to the top here. Um, so somebody wrote in and said, I, had, I found a bat on the ground uh, in their yard. And they picked it up with a glove hand and put it in the tree. Is that a good idea? And that's fine. Um, sometimes bats get knocked out of the air or they fall out of the air. They, like let's say they run into something and they just, they fall to the ground. It's hard for bats to get started uh, flying from the ground. So unlike a bird, a bird can, can start from the ground and, and start flying from the ground. The bats cannot. They start from an elevated position. So they actually kind of fall uh, out of their bat house. Or they fall out of their tree. Or they fall off the roof of their cave. And in that fall, their wings open up and then they fly. But if they have a collision and they get knocked out of the air and they're on the ground, it's difficult for them to get back up. So putting in a tree um, is a good idea because it gives them an opportunity to fly away free on its own. It also gets it up off the ground so that cats or something else don't come along and eat it. Um, and using a glove is 110% is absolutely correct. Um, some of those pictures that I showed earlier of the bats, uh, you could see that they have a mouthful of little sharp teeth 
uh, in most cases because they're insect eaters and so they're chomping up uh, uh, prey that has a crunchy uh, exoskeleton in most cases. So, so they can bite and they will bite if you, you know, just because you're a big scary thing that's picked them up. So using a glove is, is always a good idea or gloves when you're handling, for whatever reason, if you have to handle wildlife that you use gloves to protect yourself. So that was not a bad thing um, to do. Um, a bad house in the open area around here would, <laughs> and bake the sleeping bats. Yeah, and so you don't, it doesn't, you don't want to put it out in the open where it gets uh, all day long heat because you're right, it's Mississippi and it just gets dang hot around here. Uh, and so somewhere between out in full sun and in full shade is what you want to kind of shoot for. So uh, a place where it's shaded in the morning and maybe it gets noon and afternoon sun would be fine or vice versa. Uh, it's sunny in the morning, but late, you know, mid to late afternoon, it's behind the trees. And uh, so now they're in the shade is, is kind of what you're looking for on that. Um, and so, you know, so where some people leave, live, there's just not a good, there aren't good options on that. And so you see, you do see some other designs. And of course, those get more complicated and, you know, have little roofs over the top of them. But uh, with more complication comes more expense. And sometimes people don't want to go to all that trouble. But um, you're exactly right. Whether it's a bat house or a bird house, uh, you need to think about what it's going to be like in that little box all day long. And they need to have some shade at some point in the day or you, you're just going to kill everybody that's in there. Or they might just not even use it. Um, and um, for the wintertime, that's not bad. If they're just hibernating it, it won't matter. But for things like a bird house, you don't want a bird to choose that your bird house in the springtime when it's cool and then in the uh, and so that box feels pretty good. And then by, by May, the babies are baking because it just gets too hot. Um, so here's another question. What is the chance the colony outgrows our man-made habitat and takes up shelter in your home attic? Um, that, that is a possibility. Um, it depends on what species you, you had in your attic to begin with. Um, some species like the free-tailed bats um, that do show up in buildings uh, can can have big populations. But it also, the other side of that, so there's two, at least two pieces to this puzzle. You have the, the shelter part of the habitat, and that's what you're trying to provide them with a bat house, or that's what your attic is providing is that shelter. But the other side of that habitat coin is the food. And um, so while you may have lots of shelter, the area that those bats are living in may not have a prey base to be able to support large, large numbers of bats. And um, so maybe that's a complicated way of saying that. You know, in theory, that could happen. Um, but if you didn't start off with just thousands and thousands of bats in your attic, you're, you're not gonna, I don't think that's likely to happen. Um, your population, I mean, if they were in your attic, that's even a better place. It's bigger than what your bat house is. Um, and so if you have signs of that, that there's just really, really a lot of bats in your bat house, then, then you make a second bat house and maybe they will expand their populations, but that way. Um, but remember in all things habitat, it's not just the shelter, there's the food piece too, and there's water. Um, as well. So all of those things have to be present. And we get these large numbers of animals that congregate when all those things work just really, really well. But generally something is limiting and uh, whether it's food or, or shelter and that limiting factor will keep the population lower. Um, so a question about hibernation and what time of year and how long and reasons for it. So, so hibernation is a strategy that animals use to survive a period of time when, uh, when resources are limiting uh, or conditions are so extreme that, um, that it's just hazardous for them to try to survive. So uh, the other choice if you don't hibernate is you migrate. So many organisms like waterfowl uh, don't hibernate, they migrate. They leave where they were when the food gets limited. Uh, let's say they're a songbird that eats insects and in the wintertime or it starts getting cold, the insects start dying. 
So they move someplace warmer where there's still insects and they live there and then they'll go back to their breeding grounds in the springtime when, when the seasons warm back up again. Um, here in the south, um, because we don't get so cold, um, we don't have as many animals that hibernate at all. They'll go through what we, what we have here in the southeast tends to be a period of torpor, T-O-R-P-O-R. And, and torpor is a period of just kind of um, uh, deep sleep inactivity, but they're not truly hibernating. Um, there's some physiological characteristics, uh, heart rate and breathing rate and oxygen uh, consumption that are used to define the differences. Um, but so things like squirrels and bears that live in Wyoming, those, those creatures really do hibernate and they will hibernate uh, from early fall until late spring or early or mid spring uh, when conditions start getting better. Um, but here in the Southeast, we have organisms that will go into torpor, but they'll come in and out of torpor if it gets, uh, if the weather gets warm, warmer. So bats around here might go into torpor, um, maybe even as early as November. But if we end up with some, a warm time in late November, early December, I mean, we've got some times when, you know, the air conditioning is running on early December. Uh, so if you have a period like that, they'll actually come out of torpor and, and start flying around again. And then the weather will, cold snap will come back in and they'll, they'll go back into torpor. Um, same thing with the black bears that are here in Mississippi. They're not truly hibernating. Um, they do the same kind of thing. So they'll rise out and come out for a day or two and the weather is warm and then they go back and, um, and then uh, kind of the pseudo hibernation for a little bit longer. And then in the springtime when weather warms back up and the insects start to become more prevalent, then they'll, then they'll be out all the time. Um, so that's that question. So the best bat howl design for Mississippi, um, there, we don't really have any regional specificity. Um, one of the best places to go for information on bats is Bat Conservation International, BCI. Um, and they've got more information about bats than you'd ever wanna know. But it's, um, but it's good science-based information and you can get bat house designs there. Uh, it's not so much um, for the state of Mississippi as it is for how many bats you're trying to deal with. So uh, we actually have a few bat houses on campus um, and they're stuck on the outside of some of the buildings uh, way up high because there were bats that were in the building. And some of those were actually kind of small like the pictures that I showed earlier um, but there are some other uh, very large bat houses that look like, I don't know, it's like a beach house. They're a small house up on piers, and that's for when they were trying to actually move bats, the uh, large populations of bats from one place to another, so they'd have a large, a large bat house design. But for, for most of the needs that we have around here, just that small sort of oversized mailbox thing uh, is, would be appropriate for, uh, for our bats. Um, there's a question here about termite baits around houses on trees kill bats. Um, I, there are, they're not going to directly kill bats because the bats aren't going to really be feeding on termites. And I, I think that's probably what you were to mean. The bats aren't going to eat the bait per se, but if they were to eat the termites that might be around that they might get contaminated. So that's not, um, that wouldn't be a major concern for bats. Um, they're, they are a protected species. Um, you're, you're not allowed to, um, to kill them without special permission to do so. Um, our laws here in the state of Mississippi uh, are written such that if the, the law doesn't allow you to do it, if it doesn't specify that you can do it, you can't. So if, you, if you're looking up, well, can I kill a cardinal. Um, if there's nothing in the code that says, here's how you kill cardinals, you can't kill cardinal. And the answer to that is no, you can't anyway. Um, not that people want to kill cardinals, but things like woodpeckers. People do want to kill woodpeckers because they get on their houses and they make holes on their houses, but that's illegal. They're protected by the federal government as well as um, some other laws. So uh, uh, bats fall in the same category. There's no season, no time when you can take bats, when it's allowed. 
uh, it's disallowed. And uh, especially if you were to actually have some of the endangered ones um, around, then you'd really be in trouble with the federal government as well as the state. But so there's no approved bat, uh, baticides or, or other things to use on bats if you wanted to get rid of them. Things like mothballs um, do uh, drive them out. They don't like them. So if you were to put mothballs out, that would cause them to leave uh, a location. But as soon as your mothballs are gone, uh, if there's no other available habitat to, uh, for those bats, they will be back. Um, so you can drive them out with mothballs. And then you know, if you could figure out how they were getting in, block them out. That would be a plan, but you, there's nothing, no baits or something that you have to, that you can use on bats to kill them, uh, but you also don't have to worry about them um, consuming them. Uh, so how far should the bat house be placed away from the house? So one thing to keep in mind is um, uh, bats are, <laughs> bats are living creatures and they will poop. And we, we talked about the, the value of the fertilizer, the guano as fertilizer. So you wouldn't want the bat house to be really close to your house and how, if they actually moved into it and then you have, um, uh, the, the guano is gonna accumulate under the bat house. Now, they're a, they're a tiny creature and they have small poops. So it takes a long time for it to accumulate to be any kind of uh, a problem. But, um, you know, if you got kids out there playing or, uh, you know, dogs, I got dogs, dogs are gross. They eat stuff they're not supposed to eat. They would eat bat poop if it was in their yard. So I would just place a bat house, uh, you know, some distance from the house. I, I don't have a magical, um, distance, if it's very, very far away, if you're trying to move them from your house into the bat house, it needs to be within easy flying distance from the house. So they're, they're very likely to encounter it. But if you just want to put one out in the landscape um, to provide habitat, then I would, I would keep it kind of away from your house, uh, maybe, uh, I don't know, 100 yards or so, just so that uh, if you're able to get that kind of gap, so that you don't have that, you're not disturbing the bats with your activity. Um, they're likely to use it if there's not a lot of scare, you know, you're not riding a lawnmower underneath that, kids aren't screaming, dogs not barking underneath that. Um, so all that, you just kind of have to think like, where would be, where would I want to be if I was a bat and didn't want to be bothered by people and, and put it there. Um, how far is the feeding range from their home base? That is a, <laughs> that's actually a really good question. Um, and I'm sure there's some, uh, some new telemetry data. They are, they are a small animal, so they're not gonna go miles and miles uh, away from their home base. They're gonna stay relatively close. Um, most organisms don't wanna have to travel any further than they have to because that's energy lost. So if they can stay close to their home base, they will. Um, I don't know how far they will go though, but I can't imagine they're gonna go any more than a mile and probably much less than that, probably closer to a quarter of a mile. But um, I don't have a, a good hard number on that, but I could get back to uh, Christian with that if he wanted me to. Um, and then here someone pointed out, lights and attics help remove bats from the attic. And that, that's kind of what I was getting at with, um, like with the thing about where you're gonna place your bat house. Um, bats don't wanna be around people. And so lights in your attic makes that uh, an unattractive place. Mothballs in your attic makes that an unattractive place. Noise makes it unattractive. Um, and so um, where that works, where it could work against you if you're trying to put a bat house, it works for you if you're trying to keep them away from a place. So that's a really good point. Lights in the attic will help drive them out. They're, they're looking for a place to rest at night and your light in there can be a disturbance. Many animals, though, will become habituated to something that's designed to scare them away. So, um, so for example, people are trying to get cormorants off of their catfish ponds. They will employ these, they call them noise cannons. Um, they, they fire off a sound that sounds like a gun. And when that goes off, it scares the, um, the birds and they fly away. But they will learn, uh, just like birds will learn scarecrow isn't going to get them and uh, so your lights in the attic may work for a while and then it may also stop working after a while. Um, someone mo noted that wouldn't mothballs be toxic? Um, they are in, if you ate them, if they were to be eaten, but mostly what they're gonna do is just uh, 
they, they slowly um, sublimate, they, they move from that solid ball form uh, into a gaseous form. And so that would, it's, um, it's just the odor that keeps them away more than um, anything else. So you can safely use them uh, in that environment. Again, you would want to keep them where kids couldn't get them to, to them or where, you know, dogs couldn't get up into them, bother them, because if they were to consume them, that'd be a problem. But uh, it won't be a problem for the bats. Okay, so do bats really eat mosquitoes? Are they more focused on larger insects? Um, they are opportunistic. Um, they within the so they're not gonna they're not gonna grab say uh, a cicada or a katydid um, because for many of our bats uh, a katydid or a cicada is as big as the bat is. And if you were, think back to those little faces, um, they're not gonna be able to eat a really really big. Uh, insects. So whatever they can catch easily and consume easily on the, literally on the fly, um, that's the kind of thing that they're going to be eating. Um, but whatever they encounter, if they can consume it, they can grab it, eat it, and handle it, swallow it, they will. Um, do bed houses have to be cleaned off? And no, uh, because the, unlike a bird house that has a solid bottom on it, the bat house does not. Uh, it's open on the bottom, they just fly in and fly out, dropping out the bottom, and so when they, they do uh, defecate, it just falls out the bottom of the bat house. So in that sense, it's easier than, say, a bluebird box. All right. I have one question. Yeah. Uh, how about steel wool being pushed into a crevice? Yes. That's a good, um, that doesn't necessarily always work for things like rodents because they don't care um, as much, but uh, that would work well for something like a bat. They're just not as interested in, in the hard work it takes to get into a space. They crawl in, they crawl out um, easily. So steel, wood's a, uh, steel wool is a good choice. Um, that expanding foam uh, is a good choice. Sorry. So um, those things wouldn't work for rodents, but they do work for, uh, for bats. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so street lights discouraging bats. That actually, it doesn't um, because the street lights draw in insects. And so the bats learn that street lights are a source of food. And so you can go out there at night in neighborhoods uh, or around parking lots and see bats flying. Um, you can also see whippoorwills, or not whippoorwills, uh, nighthawks that'll fly as well. And they're eating the insects that are coming in into the light. So uh, it's actually, that's not a problem. Uh, is there a mating season? Yes. Do they mate for life? Uh, I don't know the answer to that question. I'll have to look it up. Uh, the babies are tiny. And again, it's going to depend a little bit on the, uh, the size of the bat. But um, I mean, you, th these bats, if you were to hold them in your, you could hold them in your hand and they would fit easily in the palm of your hand. So the babies are, are you know, thimble sized. Uh, little little guys, and and especially for the smaller bats that you know, and you might be able to hold four of the small bats in your hands, and their babies are even smaller. Um, but their gestation period is short. I don't. It's gonna. It's in the in the uh, within weeks. And I'd have to look that up, and I'm sure it varies a little bit. But I think it's somewhere around 21 days uh, is the number that comes to mind. But don't don't. Uh, don't report me to Gary Jackson if I tell you the wrong number. But it's a it's a small organism. Their gestation period is short, um, but they they are born uh, naked little uh, guys that grow their fur. Um, they when they're with their mother, they hang on to her belly and nurse. And then when she goes to fly, she leaves them behind. Um, when they're li real little, they can fly with her for short distances, but most of the time they leave them behind. Um, so um, they're, it's cool. Um, somebody's been doing some Googling. Bats will fly up to six miles from roost in search of food and up to 50 miles per night. Yeah, they do spend a lot of time flying. Um, and it would also depend on the species of bat. If, again, if they can get their food close by, flying over a street light or a stream, there's a lot of insects that will congregate around a stream or over a pond, 
Um, I see them a lot at my house, uh, in part because you can just see them, but they, they will fly up and down my driveway because there's trees on the other side of my driveway. And that kind of concentrates the insects and the bats know that and they'll fly up and down the driveway. Um, so for, for any animal, if the food is close, it's better off for them than, than having to travel far, but they, they obviously can fly a long distance and they, they stay on the wing for a long time. These are great questions, y'all. Great. Uh, if bats like caves, do they ever move under houses and crawl spaces? Is that too close to the ground? Um, my guess is it's going to be too close to the ground. The caves that I had, was in when I was doing more bat work um, tend to be uh, tend to be slightly bigger. I mean, they're, they're not opposed. It really just depends on how small your crawl space is. Uh, I, it wouldn't surprise me to have some on there, but crawl spaces often uh, also have a lot of stuff going on underneath them. So uh, if you if you're trying to keep if you know you hear squeaking and stuff under your house and you you're you're not ever seeing any sign that you don't hear you chewing. So that's one of the difference between bats and and say a mouse. If you've got bats in your attic versus mice in your attic. Uh, I got a mouse in my attic. I heard him last night. The mouse in my attic is chewing on my on my. Uh, two by fours and my joists, and I can hear that. Um, but bats do not chew on things. They're not rodents. And so you can hear them kind of moving around, soft little noises, and they make little tiny squeaky sounds that you can hear. Um, but you're not gonna hear the, cheer the chewing sound that you would do if you heard, uh, if you had a, um, a mouse or a squirrel in your attic and they're small, so they're not gonna make as much noise as say a raccoon in your attic. So, um, so it's really cool. Um, somebody asked me how I how do you develop an interest in bats and supporting them? I think um, yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, and it really what it really gets to is is kind of um, I guess my heart in trying to get people in general to just be a little more wildlife aware. Everybody's got different kind of interests. Some people really like birds. Some people like the mammals and megafauna. Um, but, but one of the deterrents is fear. Um, if people are afraid of things, they're just not going to want to, uh, do anything to support them. So I think one of the best places is just to try to get people to be a little less afraid of whatever it is, whether it's bats or, or large mammals or foxes or bugs or whatever snakes. And if they are uh, less afraid and they can see some of the benefits then, then you can start building some support for whatever it is that you're trying to do moving forward. Y'all have been a great group. I don't want to take up all your time. It's almost three o'clock. So uh, I don't know how Christian wants to wrap things up, but um, I'm going to, well, I'm going to stop. Of course, I'm uh, grateful to have your time as long as you can give it, but uh, uh, I understand that you have a, a busy schedule. I appreciate you giving the presentation on bats and I really appreciate all the answers to all, everyone's questions. And I, I appreciate all the great questions that have uh, come from